I'm Carl Schubauer, part of Pluto's Revenge rocket team. I'll be going over the design and assembly of our rocket, the Red Scare. We'll start up front at the nose cone. All of our parts are lock precision off the shelf parts. The nose cone is a 23 inch long nose cone, four inch overlap. That slides into our front section, which are lock precision body tubes. The length of the front section is 37 inches. That slides on top of our eBay, which is a 12 inch long eBay, two inch section of body tube over top. The front deploys our rover and our drogue chute. Moving to the back, we have a 38.5 inch long roof section with a fin and motor skeleton assembly. This holds our main parachute and is deployed at 500 feet. Okay, so now we'll start the front section and system integration portions. The way we went about designing the system integration was a simple Sabo setup. So the rover is completely contained within this hard foam package. The inside is carved out to accept the shape of the rover and it allows for easy adaptation based on design changes if they occur. This foam was found in the Freshman Aerospace Lab. Uh, it's high density foam. We epoxied different blocks together and cut out a circular section using centering rings that came with the rocket parts. Based on testing that will be covered later, we ended on this design. We caulked in a small piece of PVC to allow a tether to run from the nose cone all the way back through the rocket and attach to the eBay. This, during deployment, allowed the nose cone to tug out the drogue chute, and again, we will explain later why that needed to occur. So the full assembly order is body tube bolted to the eBay via these bolts. There were four of them. We fold up the drogue chute, which is a lock angel drogue size that allowed for an 18 feet per second descent rate. Wrap it in a fire blanket, rubber band up the excess tether cord, stuff all that down with a bunch of uh, recovery wadding. The Sabo and rover package with the rover chute contained on top pushes down on top of the drogue chute. And the nose cone with the excess tether cord up top, rubber banded, slides onto the front. Now I'll cover the eBay assembly. The eBay is a standard lock precision eBay. Um, comes as an assembly, comes with standard hardware, standard rail buttons. That's what we use to component off the shelf. The blast caps on either end are PVC caps. They were sanded down on the bottom to provide a flat surface to bolt through the bulkhead. The front deployment had five grams of powder that was tested extensively during pop testing, covered later. The rear had four. The tray, again, standard lock precision part. We had switches from Radio Shack, standard slider switches, epoxied into the inside of the eBay with a little slot cut. They were hard epoxied in. Every time we needed to install the tray, we wired up the switch to the altimeters and slid the tray in. The batteries, 9 volt batteries that power the altimeters, are held in by perfect flight 9 volt battery clips. They are bolted to the tray and we slap a piece of duct tape over top to keep it steady. They are perpendicular to the direction of flight to prevent them sliding out of the tray. The altimeters were set to uh, drogue deployment and a preset of 500 feet for main. We ran two altimeters. So we had two E-matches going to the drogue deployment and two E-matches running to the main deployment. And this was to give a dual redundancy in case of faulty E-matches or a faulty altimeter or dead battery. All right, finally, we'll go over the rear section of the rocket. The rear section starts over here with the eBay, which was just covered. The main body tube slides over the eBay and is attached with one shear pin. The deployment was performed with four grams of powder, which was pop tested. We have the main parachute covered in a fire blanket. It's a lock angel large and allowed for a descent rate of less than 18 feet per second. That's tethered to the back bulkhead of the eBay and was tethered through the rear section and double eye bolted to the front bulkhead of the motor skeleton assembly, which we'll cover in a second. A bulkhead or centering ring was epoxied inside the rear tube. Four holes were drilled to accommodate 
the four holes necessary for attachment on the motor skeleton. Two rail buttons were installed 16 inches apart. The motor skeleton constructed to be adaptable and accept disposable fins mates up with the centering ring on the inside of the rear section. We have two eye bolts with a bridge tether to prevent spinning and detachment of the parachute. That's tied to the main tether up to the main parachute. We also have epoxied in two bolts that slide through the centering ring and a nut is slid on through the top to attach everything together. Slots were cut in the rear section tube to accommodate the fins. The fins are attached in between two posts, two pillars. Holes were drilled through all three and the fin is bolted in. The motor that slides into the motor skeleton is an Aerotech J800. With the Aerotech J800, we achieve an altitude simulated of 13 to 1400 feet. And the margin with this weight in the back is roughly 1.68 loaded. Hi, my name is Colin Francis. I was the lead structural uh, design behind the Pluto's Revenge rover, and I'm going to be taking you through the design considerations that we went through in order to successfully create our rover. So ideally we wanted a rover that was going to be able to withstand loads on both launch and landing. Um, the other consideration that was necessary in order to complete the course was that the rover would be able to be operational regardless of whether it lands on the top or the bottom. So with respect to durability of our rover, um, we, we made a couple considerations on different components and materials we wanted to use. So I'm going to walk you through the uh, different design considerations we made. Um, so our rover is made out of aluminum, which is both high strength and lightweight. We had to meet a design requirement of two kilograms. So in order to do that and keep strength, we wanted to use an all aluminum frame. Um, so the top, you can see we have our parachute release mechanism. There's two U-bolts here that generally hold ropes, but then we have the servo mechanism that has an arm. Um, once this triggers, it can pull out. And with that, the um, parachute gets uh, detached. So now if I open this up, um, on either side, we have two 92 millimeter rubber wheels. Uh, both have shaft couplers that couple onto a four millimeter DC motor shaft. Uh, the motors themselves are attached to a 25 millimeter Pololu motor mount. Um, the back here, we have an omnidirectional wheel. This permits the uh, movement forward as well as side to side. Uh, that's in order to complete a 90 degree turn that was necessary in order to complete our um, requirements. Um, there is a high strength four inch shaft in here that passes through the um, omnidirectional wheel. And on either side of that, there's shaft couplers in order to hold it in place so that we don't have any movement. And it gives it the ability to spin freely. Um, those are attached to Pololu 25 millimeter motor mounts. We drilled through either side. They're high strength aluminum and we bolted them down. So in order to make our rover as water resistant as possible, we covered the siding with um, extruded C-channel aluminum. Uh, you can see the front plate covers the front completely and we have bolts going down through that house the inner components. Um, we had two side plates that fit on and basically cover the sides. And then we had two back plates right here, left and right. Now the right one uh, holds our servo marker drop mechanism. There's another little C channel with holes drilled through it and you can see two servo arms. Uh, the basic premise of this is we rotate one way, this pulls out, uh, drops the first marker, and then when we're ready to drop the second marker, this pushes back in, pulls out the second one, drops the second marker. So now that we've gone through the structural design considerations, I'm now gonna turn your attention to the inside electronic components. Um, on either side of the rover, we have two 99 to one gearbox ratio DC motors. The center, uh, basically the brain of the rover was an Arduino Mega. Uh, right here is an L298N H-Bridge motor driver. On the left side, we have a breadboard with an altimeter attached to it. I'm Nanette Valentor. I was the rover assistant lead, so I was in charge of all of the rover system. And I'm going to go over all the components with you. So as you can see here, we used an Arduino Mega. We chose to use a Mega over an Uno because there are more digital pins on a Mega. Here, the motor driver is connected to the Arduino via six digital and pulse width modulation pins. 
on the motor shield, there are two pulse width modulation pins on the outside, and there are four pins that must be connected to a digital pins on the Arduino. And all these pins together determine how fast the motors are moving, where they're going, how long they're going, and when to stop and start them. So the servo here and the servo mounted on the top plate are connected to the Arduino via two pulse width modulation pins, one from one servo, one from another servo, and then they are powered via a breadboard that is also connected to the Arduino by a power and ground. The two servos are powered externally by a battery that we use to also power the Arduino board, and that power is fed from the Arduino board into the breadboard and then grounded back to the Arduino board. As you can see here, we use an altimeter for our rover arming sequence. The altimeter works by detecting a change in height and we had a set value of when we wanted to start a timer depending on the height change. So after the rover was launched from the rocket, we had a value of negative 50 feet. After the rover had fallen the 50 feet, a timer of eight minutes would start. After eight minutes, the, the servo on top would release the parachute, the servo on the side would release the marker. So our battery that we used to power the motors was an, another our external battery. It was mounted to the top plate, so when you place the plate on top of the rover, it was stuck on the top like that. And this battery was a six volt battery, and we powered the motor shield with it, and then that powered the two motors. Moving on to component testing for the rover. To begin, we had our two DC motors, and we tested these to determine their rotation speeds, and using the Arduino and Arduino test, test files, we realized that there was a slight delay from the Arduino signal to the motor. So one motor did start slightly before the second motor, but that was part of how Arduino works, and there wasn't much we could do about it. For the servos, we tested them individually to determine the start and end angle of where this needs to move to drop both markers same with the parachute servo, the start and end angle of how it needs to move to pull the pin out of the slot. For the altimeter, we specifically needed this sensor to arm our rover after being in the rocket. For this sensor, we tested it by taking it in an elevator and we set the descent height to 5, 10, 20 feet in increments and we made sure that after it was dropped from that height that the motors would turn on and drive the specified core sequence as both servos were also working for the sequence for our indoor and outdoor drive testing. After indoor and outdoor drive tests had been completed, we fully assembled the rover, packaged it into the rocket for integration, and did a flight test. The flight test verified both rover and rocket designs were correct and were final. The test plan for rocket design was performed after every step of the design and all the way through until competition day. Once a design was decided upon, a rocket sim model was generated to check clearance fits. Based on those results, we moved into physical clearance fits for the components before fabrication to prevent manufacturing waste. Based on those clearance fits, the model was completed, fabrication was completed, and we entered pop testing. Based on the results of pop testing, we moved into flight tests with a dummy rover, and based on those results, we moved into flight tests with a real rover. Three pop tests and two flight tests were necessary to verify the final integration and deployment design. The final flight test which used a rover prototype and the actual Sabo configuration to be used at competition, successfully deployed with the main recovery system, which validated our final design and made us confident going to competition. Each test type includes its own safety protocols and documents for rocket testing. For the POP testing, a black powder deployment test plan was created and sent to Samir at Center Hill to be verified. The powder was pre-measured and transported with the E-matches in an ammo case. 
The rocket body was securely strapped to a support table with the back supported by a structural wall to prevent blowback. The e-matches were only attached to the switch circuit when no battery was included. Before popping, the blast zone was cleared with an audible warning and visually verified before flipping the switch. A countdown was also performed before the switch flip. Power was immediately turned off after deployment and a battery disconnected before inspection. To begin the pop testing, we started from a known safe amount, 2 grams, before increasing by 0.5 grams to 5 grams, which successively deployed the weight of the rover. Results were documented and recorded for future use in flight tests. After pop tests, test flights were performed. The safety concerns for these are as follows. A launch prep guide was developed, which was verified by Tim Arnett. Altimeter settings were checked before installing any e-matches, and batteries were disconnected before installing the e-matches. The switches were verified off visually before plugging in batteries and assembling the eBay. Powder caps were pre-measured and transported in the ammo box, similar to pop testing. Flights were only conducted with simulations performed first in Roxin. Motors were assembled under the supervision of experienced flyers for the first three flight tests. This was the LCO, and at competition, this was the motor vendor. The design was verified with the LSCO before each launch. The motor cap was kept on the nozzle until it loaded on the pad. The firing wires were checked for power before and after installing the igniter match and before installing the wires to the match. All NAR protocols were followed at the field 